I, I'm preaching on the baptism of Jesus as a significant event in Jesus' life and in our lives. So what I want to do first is just look simply at what happened. And that's the easiest part of the message right here. So if we look at in Mark what happened, it's pretty clear to us. If we look at Mark 1 verses 9 through 11, up on the screen there, it's three verses. And that, that was the first thing that kind of surprised me. I thought, well, this is a big event. And, and I, I've read about it before. And when I started to look, I said, it's only three verses. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And that's it. Those three verses are the baptism of Jesus. Now, if you look at Luke, Luke 3, 21 through 22, says basically the same, condenses it down to two verses. Basically the same thing, though. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So this baptism of Jesus shows up in all four gospel accounts. I think that's a key that is significant. And more or less, it's the same account. Sometimes we don't see that in the gospel when, when certain things happen and, we, and we're left with questions. Well, why was this there or what were the details? But in, in all four gospels, we really see the same basic account and it's pretty succinct. In fact, what we see more of is John preparing the way for Jesus. If we look, we see two or three verses about Jesus' actual baptism, but we get a whole chapter ahead of it about John preparing the way for Jesus' coming, why he was baptizing, why he was baptizing, what he was doing with that. So the first thing I have on your fill-ins is that this is a seemingly ordinary ritual cleansing. Seemingly ordinary, but it's met with an extraordinary response. Now, I put that seemingly there because anytime we're talking about Jesus, we really probably shouldn't apply the word ordinary, right? There's nothing at all that's going to be ordinary there with Jesus. But at least on the surface, this baptism is fairly ordinary. On the surface, as we look at it, there have been people who have been bathed in the Jordan before in the Old Testament. We saw Naaman go to Elisha, and he says, bathe in the, the, the Jordan right in that river. Bathe in that Jordan seven times and you'll be healed of your leprosy and it works. We see back in the Old Te Testament in, the, in Leviticus, in the Leviticus laws, we see that when people were unclean, they were supposed to go through these ritual cleansing processes. So on the surface, this is fairly ordinary. And just to point out to you how ordinary in that account from Luke, I love the understatement when he says, when all the other people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized. Like to just throw that, oh yeah, all these other people, and Jesus was too, by the way. That's how ordinary this was as a ritual cleansing. And yet it's met with that absolutely extraordinary response. So that's the what happened. That's the easy part. The next one I wanted to go to is, why was he baptized? So why was John baptizing in the first place? Again, scripture could not be any clearer. I think I counted up six or seven times where it tells us why John was baptizing. If you go through the four gospel accounts, John was preaching a baptism of repentance. There's your second fill-in already. See, it's not going to take that long after all. He was preaching a baptism of repentance. John said it himself. I preach a baptism, baptism of repent, repentance. Be forgiven of your sins. It was a baptism of forgiveness. Same baptism that we have today, a baptism of repentance. So that's easy, but then that leaves you with the really hard question. Why was Jesus baptized? He's the only one who didn't need to be baptized. Anybody else in all of history needed this baptism. And yet Jesus, who was sinless, was the only one who could have gone to John and said, no thanks, I'm good, and truly meant it. He didn't need to be baptized. And I thank John the Baptist so much because he asked that question for us. 
He actually asked that question. If we look in Matthew 3, 13 through 15, Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him. Because John said to him, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And John is not wrong in any way. John is exactly right. He's asking that same question I just did. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Because remember what John was doing in all of the lead up to those verses about the baptism that I said there are about John. He's saying, I'm preparing a way. I'm the one that was spoken of in Isaiah. I'm, I'm making the valleys, uh, or raising the valleys, making the mountains low, making the path straight. I'm preparing. John was like the rototiller for the garden. He was softening the ground. He was getting it ready for Jesus to come. And then Jesus shows up. And we can tell by this, John was surprised because he, didn't, he wasn't expecting Jesus to come to him to be baptized. That wasn't apparently in the orders he was given from God. He was baptizing everybody else. But when Jesus shows up, he says, oh, good, you're here. And instead, Jesus says, no, I, I'm here to be baptized. So we get the answer from Jesus. We get the answer to that question, why was he baptized? And it's a little flowery. Uh, Jesus, Jesus tends to speak in riddles. He tends to, to not speak as clearly as sometimes I would like when I'm reading my Bible. But I think this one's not bad. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And that obviously was enough for John, because then John consented and John baptized him. So that answer worked for him. So it has to work for us. And I think it does. I pulled out two things from that answer. The first one is that submitting to baptism signified that Jesus carried the sins of the world. That's the fulfilling all righteousness part. If you were under the impression that that's what happened on the cross, you're right. But I would submit to you that's not the first time that that happened, that the baptism, Jesus is taking the sins of the world to fulfill all righteousness. Because remember, that was his mission on earth. That's why he was sent. We just celebrated Christmas a few weeks ago, and that's why Jesus was sent to earth, was to restore, was to reconcile, was to rebuild. He was taking what was broken, our relationship with God, and he had to restore it. And the way to restore it was to become the sacrifice for sin. So I'm not necessarily moving to the cross, but I, I want you to see that right here at the baptism, I think the same logic applies. Jesus was sinless, and yet he underwent this baptism of repentance. He underwent this baptism of forgiveness for sins because he was taking on the sins of the world. And he was making a clear public declaration of that when he said to fulfill all righteousness. The other piece of it is that I think it also showed his love and loyalty to the Father. That's the part where it says it is proper. Now, when, when Jesus says it is proper, he's not talking at all about the religious conventions of the time. He's not talking about what the world expects of him. Because we know when we apply scripture as a whole, that didn't matter to Jesus at all. In fact, he often turned it on his head. For him, the only thing he concerned about, he was concerned about was pleasing the Father. So when he says that it is proper, what he's saying is it's the right thing to do. Not the right thing to do because anybody else expects it of me, but the right thing to do because this is what God has called me to do. Again, you can take that very clearly and you can apply it to the cross as well. When he says, not my will, but yours. That's what he's doing here, I think, when he says, it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Because he's saying, God has called me to, the, to do this right now. He has called you to do this right now. And he's saying that this is what we're going to do to establish that I'm here as the Lamb of God. I'm here to, to take on this sacrifice. I think the other word we need to be careful not to skip over is, let it be so now. He's very clearly saying, this is what happens now. John speaks in all the preparation that there is one who is coming who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
And Jesus is saying, yeah, that, that time is coming. He's acknowledging that when he says, let it be so now. You're going to baptize me now. But then eventually my time will be coming where I will be baptizing. So that question gets answered. Why was he baptized? And I think it's those two ways. Because he's carrying those sins and because the father had asked him to. But then we get into what I think becomes a little bit of the harder stuff. So the next section I add is, what did or what does it mean? And I think both of those are important. We can't get stuck in the past. The Bible always works on multiple layers. And we can look at what did it mean for the people at the time? What did it mean for Jesus? And I think we have to do that. But we have to also see what does it mean for us? In other words, why do we get baptized now? That comes from the response. That extraordinary response that I mentioned, that gives us the significance of it. If we just look at Jesus went into the Jordan, came out, and was baptized, we might miss what all the significance is of it. So the first thing I would say for what did and what does it mean is that heaven is opened. Every account that we have, it says that heaven is opened. And what that means is that we are given direct access to God. We have direct access between God and man. It's restored. That's how it was supposed to be. In the garden with Adam, they, Adam and Eve were walking with the Lord. And that got broken. Remember, it fits all in with Jesus' reclamation mission. So what happens when the heaven is opened is we now have that direct access, and we have it through Jesus. We have that ability that we've already exercised today to be able to pray directly to the Father, to be welcomed into the throne room, to be able to bring our cares, our concerns, our pleas, our requests, all before him, and know that we're not going to be turned away. Because heaven has been opened, that access has been granted. I think it's kind of interesting because in the, I think it is in, in the Luke account, the word that is used is actually it was torn open. Heaven was torn open. It might be Mark. It might be the Mark account. But heaven is torn open. And in doing some research, that's the exact same word that was used when the curtain was torn at Jesus' crucifixion. The curtain that separated the rest of the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies, which was supposed to be the access to God that, that only a very few could, could access at certain times in the year. And when Jesus was crucified, that curtain was torn from top to bottom, signifying the access to heaven. And that same word is used here. So when we look at heaven being opened, what did it mean? It meant that that direct access was there, but what does it mean? It's still there for us. The second thing is that the Spirit is given. We see that as the Holy Spirit coming down. Now, I'm going to suggest Jesus was already filled with the Holy Spirit because he was fully God. He's part of the Trinity. I'm going to suggest he was already full of the Holy Spirit. But that dove coming down, resting on him, is significant because what it did was it showed us what happens at baptism. It shows us that at baptism, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, for Jesus, I think it's important to note, it says the Holy Spirit rested on him and equipped him to do his work, to go about his ministry. If we think about it, this is Jesus. It's usually assumed to be about 30 years old. And up until that point in Jesus' life, he was a carpenter. Up until that point, I'm not going to say there was nothing remarkable about him, but there's nothing notated in the Gospels. Very little, right? We have the Christmas story, run away to Egypt. We have one little story about him at the temple. And then nothing until this. So I think the Holy Spirit being given is significant because it shows us this is when that ministry begins. This is when it began for Jesus, but it's also when it begins for us. When we're baptized and we're welcomed into God's family again, we're reunited in the family we were meant to be in, then that equips us for ministry. We now have access to the Holy Spirit. 
We have access to the counselor that can guide us. And then the final thing I have is that a child is proudly claimed by God. So we have those, those amazing words, behold, this is my child with whom I am well pleased. I'm going to suggest to you, God says those words every time somebody is dunked in that tank. We may not hear them. It may not be as clear as it is recorded in Scripture. But I truly believe that, that every time there is a baptism taking place, God is saying, behold, this is my child with whom I am well pleased. He's welcoming us back. Think of the, of the, the scriptures about the 99 sheep and, and the one goes, goes away. And, and how, how at the end of it, it, it says there, how much rejoicing there is in heaven over that one who has been found and returned. Or, or the 10 coins that, and, and one is lost and, and, and the widow sweeps the house and, until she finds it and gathers all her friends. And it, it says there is more rejoicing over in heaven over that one. Isn't that what's happening right there? When God says, behold, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He's saying that about Jesus. But if we pull up Hebrews 2.11, this was just one of those little gem of verses that I've probably read a bunch. And I just came across it this week and I was like, oh my gosh, like what a verse. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Just read that yourself for a moment and let that one sink in. That just, it, it's, it's nothing I didn't already know, but to have it just in one verse like that, I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. The one who makes po- people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy, us, are of the same family. So again, why wouldn't God be saying when we're baptized, This is my child with whom I am well pleased. So when I say what did and what does it mean, when we go through baptism, it may be a fairly ordinary process. We may have seen people go through it a bunch. We we, we may see it a few times a year here. It may be a long time since we've been baptized but I'm going to suggest to you the response is just as extraordinary. Those three things that I talked about are happening when we have a baptism here. Heaven is being opened up to that individual. They're receiving that direct access to God. They're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, hey, look, this is my child. Welcome home. So the last part I have here, I may have already covered. I might just be saying it a different way. How important was or is Jesus' baptism? The first thing I would tell you is that it is the beginning of his earthly ministry. And it mirrors the end of his earthly ministry. And I've touched on that a little bit already today. The baptism was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And it mirrors the end. It mirrors the crucifixion, the resurrection. I want to pull up Acts 1, 21 through 22. This, uh, just to give you a little background, is when the disciples are trying to replace Judas. They're coming up with, well, how do we find a replacement for Judas? Right at the very beginning of Acts. And here was the qualification. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Okay? So they want somebody who was a first-hand witness, and they say it has to be somebody who was with us the whole time Jesus was among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So that's one of the ways that I can say Scripture supports me. This was the beginning of his ministry. Because they said, to be one of these original disciples, you didn't have to be there at Christmas in Bethlehem, but you did have to be there from his baptism. You had to have spent those three years with him the entire time. So it's a pretty narrow pool that they had to choose from. 
right? Only people who would have been there at the Jordan at the time of his baptism, okay, up through his ascension. I'll give you another one, Acts 10, 37 and 38. If we pull that one up, this is in uh, the basically sermon that Peter is giving where at the end of it, 3,000 are baptized, 3,000 are brought, in, brought into the kingdom. It's right after the Holy Spirit has descended at Pentecost. And here's what he says. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. It's a very clear mark. It's a, it's a defining in time. Right? It's, it's not, we, we tend to define time between when Jesus was born, right? That, that's where our calendar starts. You know, as, as, we, as we count it, we say, from when Jesus arrived on earth. Peter is saying, no, no, here's, here's when that break in time was. Here's when the old and the new was. The new started with Jesus' baptism. I find that interesting. He doesn't even say it started with the crucifixion. We, we sometimes as Christians might go there and say, oh, well, that's, that's when the world was reclaimed, was with the crucifixion. He says all of that worked together. It started with the baptism. So it was the beginning, the end of his ministry. That's how important it was. Second thing I think that's really important is this, as far as I can tell, is one of the first public affirmations of who Jesus was. If we look at John 1, 29 through 34, and we take a look. Now, th this, this we have to be careful. It's in the Gospel of John, but this is John the Baptist they're talking about here. The next day, John, so John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him. This isn't in the other accounts, by the way, so there are some small, small discrepancies, but this one I think is really important. He sees Jesus coming toward him to be baptized, and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew. He knew before anybody else, right? That's why he was preparing the way. God had blessed him with this opportunity to know before anybody else and, and, and to say, here's who this is. This isn't just somebody else, right? We have the one account that says, while everybody else was being baptized, so was Jesus. I don't think they meant it that way, but that's how it comes across. But, but John, very different. John the Baptist says, look, Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He, he's, he gets the full picture. He says, no, this is God. He was before me. He, he's been around a lot longer than I have. He's part of, 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 of the creation. And he's here with us now in our midst. A little bit after this, uh, I think it's the next day, John is talking, and, and he sees Jesus coming again. And he says, there, behold, the Lamb of God. Two of the disciples say, okay, see you, John. And they, they take off with Jesus. I don't think John was upset about it. Those are Jesus' first two disciples, because John is pointing the way. His mission is done now. He's now saying, this is Jesus's. So we get this affirmation of Jesus and what his purpose is, why he's there. The final thing I put out there for how important this moment is in, in, in the life of Jesus, but also in our lives, I put that it's the most obvious, and I included a question mark because maybe one of the pastors here who have more training, because I'm just up here talking, but one of you might be able to tell me there's a better place. But I put that, to me, I think it's the most obvious place in all of Scripture that the Trinity is simultaneously apparent that we have the Father, Son, and Spirit all in one place. Because we have the Son coming up out of the water. In some accounts it says praying. We have the Spirit descending. And we have the Father speaking. And like I said, you know, feel free, that can be next week's message is correcting all my errors. But, but to me, that, that right there tells you the significance of this. Father, Spirit, and Son are are so clearly, so obviously invested in this moment that we've got the entire Trinity rejoicing and celebrating in this baptism, in the fact that this ministry is now beginning, in the fact that, that this, this is now that reclamation project that not, hasn't just waited 30 years, 
You know, it hasn't just been since, since you know, the, the, the birth of Jesus till now, but, but this has been since the beginning of creation. It's been since the fall that this plan has been in place of, all right, we're going to set things right, and we're going to do that. And all three branches of the Trinity are there celebrating that moment. They're all invested in that moment. Again, when I do a parallel to the cross, it made me think of, of Jesus when he quotes, quotes uh, Psalm 30. And then Psalm 31 and says, uh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But there it's usually a small s. But we have, you know, another example of Father, Son, Spirit. But, but this one just stands out to me. So I want to wrap it all up with just a few more. I, obviously, I love to throw a lot of scripture because I, I think that speaks better than me. So put up uh, Acts 2, please, 37 through 39. So this is after... The, the part where I told you that, that Peter is preaching and he, he's saying to them, hey, here's what happened from the time Jesus was baptized till the time that he was crucified, resurrected, ascended. And all the people then that heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter, the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. You see, Jesus has now set that as the standard. He's now set that as, as a standard. You, you want to be with me, you go through baptism like I did. If, if you want to be one of my followers, if you want to be like Christ, if you want to be Christian, repent and be baptized. It's that same, same baptism, a baptism of repentance. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So there now is what we see being that righteousness being fulfilled, right? Where it was said that Jesus is going to baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus said, oh, for now, but now we see the other side of that because now baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And there it is, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Peter was preaching it Shortly after Jesus' death, this baptism. Final scripture is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's probably a very familiar one to many of you. The Great Commission. This is why Peter did what he did. is because Jesus had told him to. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's your Trinity again. They were present for the first baptism, and Jesus right there tells us they are present for every single baptism because he says that's what you're going to do. You're going to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. My goal today was very simple. As I started to put the, mes the message together and I, I started to think, you know, what, what do we want to get out of this? My number one goal, the next time we see a baptism, I would love for some of this to be in your mind, in my mind, in our hearts. I would love for us to be reminded of Jesus' baptism and realize that the Trinity is with us. Realize that we're watching somebody being filled with the Holy Spirit, being equipped for God's work. Realize that we're seeing a child being claimed by God and maybe being reminded ourselves of that moment if we've gone through that. 